Welcome to the Find the Way podcast. In this show, we will try to explore what is happening in emerging markets and how entrepreneurs, investors, and communities are simply finding the way to make phenomenal things happen, regardless how volatile the environment may sometimes seem. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to present to you today to Paula Ene, all the way from Chile. Paula is the partner and co-founder of Platanos Ventures, an early-stage startup accelerator created by technology entrepreneurs and supported by Corner Shop and Fintual. Platanos Ventures is heavily inspired by Y Combinator and aims to create an alternative to YC in Latam. Currently, Platanos Ventures offers an investment of $100,000 in exchange for 7% stake in the startup, a three-month mentorship program by successful digital product entrepreneurs, and the possibility of raising capital on a demo day, which marks the end of each generation. Platanos Venture was founded in 2020 with the purpose of discovering and creating more high-impact digital companies in Latin. It has invested in 63 early-stage digital startups throughout the region and plans to invest in 100 more by 24. Before Platanus Ventures, Paula was leading the acceleration and internationalization area of the first government-run acceleration in Chile called Startup Chile. Within her time at Startup Chile, she was supporting over 500 founding teams, and that experience led her to build Platanus Ventures. Super excited to have you here, Paula. We're in a sunny and beautiful Santiago de mm-hmm. Chile. We're excited to visit your facilities over here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for the interest in me and Platinus Ventures. Would you be able to give a little intro to who's Paula? Yeah. Who are you? Um, I'm me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm Chilean. I was born in Chile. Um, I was raised in Tokyo, Japan. Came back when I was 10 years old. Um, I kind of stayed here. I'm 35 right now, so it's been a while. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a psychologist, so I studied that and I loved it. It was really, really fun, uh, but I never really saw myself applying that knowledge in the real wor- world. So as soon as I graduated on a Thursday, I started my first company on the next Monday. So the first thing I did was a content company. It was, mm-hmm. we wanted to be BuzzFeed for Latam. I did this with my brother, Gonzalo. And it was 2014. Startups were kind of not a thing yet, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Not in Latin America anyways. Uh, so we wanted to be BuzzFeed for Latam and kind of went through the Joe Pulitzi methodology. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but basically he says, you should first build an audience that is very loyal to you and who you understand profoundly. So you understand what these readers are thinking, what their pains are, what kind of upsets them, what brings them, uplifts them and whatever. Um, and then you monetize over that because you understand mm-hmm, these mm-hmm. people and you can actually provide them something that they would need. Yeah. Um, so we did that. We did the audience thing like really well we did we had millions of uh, views over our website per month Um, but the second part the monetizing part was really hard for us we were first time founders and yeah it was just also a hard industry Um, so anyways I I did that and eventually after two years of kind of pushing this we decided to not dedicate our time because it was very valuable. But it's still alive. The company's still alive and going forward. Yeah. The interesting thing is that we kind of put it in uh, all the content in an automated cycle of publishing. And we said like, okay, so whenever like the publishing cycle is more and the servers are more expensive than whatever comes from that through ads, we'll close the company. Thinking that that would be maybe like four months from whenever we stopped. But it actually lasted like five or six years. Uh I just closed that company like a year ago um, because finally that happened. Like, you know, the servers were more expensive than whatever was coming in through ads. It wasn't that much money, but it was still kind of, I don't know, like unexpected, I guess, income. Um, So I closed that company and I wanted to do more, uh, like build more stuff, um, but kind of needed perspective and time to figure out what that was going to be. Um, so I was invited to join um, a Chilean program called Startup Chile. So Startup Chile, um, and I'll deep dive in this because I think it might be interesting to I, I think it can be super important because it's it's a very, let's say, different approach that other countries are doing in, in Latin America. Yeah, definitely. So basically, Startup Chile is a government-run acceleration program. It was born in 2010. To give you kind of perspective on that, YC was created in 2005 which is YC is the first acceleration program ever, right? That's kind of their big innovation. 
So w- there was a Chilean student in Stanford. He kind of saw what was happening in Silicon Valley and came back to Chile. And instead of doing this thing privately, he understood that, you know, LATAM wasn't there yet. Like the capabilities of the founders weren't there yet. There wasn't enough money going around. Um, but we still should have more entrepreneurs because, you know, this is what's going to make the region progress. Um, so he implemented an acceleration program for the government, and it's run mm-hmm. by an entity which is quite important in Chile called Corfo. So Startup Chile, in the beginning, they would give out equity-free grants, let's say 100K, to foreign founders, American founders, European founders. Um, so Did these, that mean that they need to relocate to yes. Chile? or? Yeah, that was the deal. So I'll give you free money, which wasn't very common, I guess, back then. Um, and against that money, I'm not going to ask for equity of your company, but I'm going to ask for hours of your time. So these guys yeah. would come to Chile. Um, and like the founder was very idealistic. And his dream was like, hopefully he'll meet a Chilean woman or a Chilean yeah. guy and they'll get married and kind of establish themselves here. Um, and that did happen in, certain, awesome. <laughs> in a awesome. certain way. But um, but yeah, so basically they would come here and relocate for six months. And in those six months, they would do classes in universities. They would mentor local founders. And kind of bring the mindset that um, a startup founder should have, which is don't build locally, right? Always build globally. Yeah. Um, so that was that was like what they were doing back then. Um, so I entered this program to support founders. And I got to support about 500 companies, so more founders, uh, in the three years that I was there. So this is a very big program. It's and a the money policy. is coming from the government of yeah. Chile. Um, taxes, taxes. Like taxes. citizens' taxes. Um so yeah, uh, it's coming from the government. It doesn't have like that big of a budget for the impact that it actually creates. So I how think big is the the? I'm not sure if I can say, but yeah, the ballparks. Are you able to give ballparks? Yeah, I mean, probably back then it would have. I don't know. Like a small seed fund in Latam has more budget than okay. whatever this government program had. Um, and it was doing about 200 to 250 like investments, if you may, uh, per year. So it's like a very impactful thing. It's very efficient. The people that built it are very competent people. Um, and, you know, when you think of government, you don't really think innovation, right? Like governments are slow. They're like very comfortable with whatever is being done. But the interesting thing about Startup Chile is that it was insignificant because it didn't have enough money. Like it doesn't have a big budget. So when you're in government, like everyone kind of gravitates toward well, like whatever has a bigger budget because it can create a bigger yeah. impact. So it was kind of like the underdog, like no one was paying any attention to this whatever program, like this crazy Stanford student wanted to build. Yeah. Um, so I think that was just serendipitous. I don't think it was intentional, but it was, it was what made Startup Chile, whatever it is right now, because um, it had its own culture, its own, it attracted different, different kind of people to the team. And yeah, it was amazing. It's a very... Um, it's a very successful public policy. And that was like the initiator of the game of startups and technology in Chile. Or was there anything prior to that? Oh, really uh, no. I think before that, like whatever was happening was like literally maybe 50 people in the country kind of doing barbecues and saying like, let's talk about technology and like what we can build. But it was very grassroots. Um, so Startup Chile kind of, I think, f- like brought volume and formalized what an angel investor would have been. It was like, so you have, if you had like very few angel investors with Startup Chile, it was like if you had like angel investors, like massively um, kind of injecting capital to these promising founders. Um, so yeah, it was definitely like a before and after thing. It's 10 years old right now as a public policy or more, it's 13 yeah. years old. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I was there and I worked with all of these teams and because it's a public policy, you need to have a lot of volume. Um, so... A lot of the teams, well, not a lot of the teams, but the teams that did well uh, normally had one thing in common, which was that they had a technical founder within the founding team, Um, which makes a lot of sense when you come to think like if you're building a digital product, you should have the inner capability to build the product, like literally build the product, not outsource it and say like, I don't know, if you're going to do, if you're going to do like a sushi restaurant, like you would need someone who understands about sushi to kind of come into the founding team, right? Um, and that would be, you know, after 10 years in Japan, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, you're the course. specialist <laughs> by, by this point in time. No, well, yeah. Um, but anyway, so um, I was, I had that in mind. And very randomly, um, there was, there's a company in Chile called Fintual. It's a fintech. It's a pretty successful Latin American company, not Chilean. 
Um, so they were the first in many things uh, for us. Um, and one, well, they were the first to raise uh, capital with Sequoia in Chile and like the third company in, in LATAM. And the other ones are Nubank, which, which is already a public company. Um, so yeah, so they're very admired in the local ecosystem and in the regional ecosystem. And I got to meet with the founders. They had a podcast called The Fintualist. So they wanted for people to be able to invest their money uh, in a friendlier way. So like you can invest your money through Fintual and it's not complicated. It doesn't have like the jargon of the banks and like the small letters and blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. It's just a very straightforward thing. And it's like a friend of you talking to you about how you should invest your money. Uh, so they had a podcast um, where they would talk about financial things. And for some reason, they decided to invite me to their podcast. For me, it was like, well, I'm just working government, but whatever, I'll go. Um, and soon after I realized, well, soon after that, Agustin, which is one of the Fintual founders, told me like, hey, I've been, look, I've been building companies for years. I have had a couple of exits. Um, I've done investments on my own. I'm mentoring a lot of startups. I love it, but I don't have time for it anymore because I'm focusing on Fintual, which makes mm -hmm, sense. Mm -hmm. But I kind of really want to scale this um, and maybe we should do something together. And I was like, hey, like I've been doing this at Startup Chile. And it's a bit frustrating to me that we can't select the teams with technical founders inside them because Startup Chile is a public policy. It's not yeah, a private yeah. investor. You can't have a thesis. Um, and we're like, okay, like, boom. Like, let's build something together. So we built Platinus Ventures. Um, with, with, we're five co-founders, so it's not just, just the two of us. Um, so yeah, like looking at it backwards, that podcast interview was probably like a co-founder interview in oh, disguise. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. It's a great way to find a co-founder for sure. So yeah, maybe you'll meet your potential co-founder in this uh, podcasting these, yeah. journey. So yeah, and what Platinus Ventures is right now, so we're an acceleration program. We invest in digital companies in Latin America where the founders speak Spanish and at least one of them is technical and can build the like the technology area, not just the product, but can do like the correct hires, um, can have like the mindset that you need to build a very big um, digital company. Yeah, that's just I don't want to extend it more. No, so no, no. okay, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And bl how old is Platinus Ventures? Three years. Three old, years now, exactly. Yeah. And how many investments do you have? Sixty-three. Sixty-three. Today. That's quite a bit. Yeah. Well, we started really small and experimental. We did four in twenty twenty. That was it. We actually didn't raise a proper fund until now because we didn't just want to do this because we wanted to do this. We wanted to do this because if it made sense for the market and for the founders, then we would scale it. Yeah. So, yeah, we did four investments in 2020 and those four investments became well known, I guess. Or, well, it's very early stage. So we do, do idea stage normally. Um, so those four investments did well and we kind of attracted the attention of, you know, people around us. And we raised a small fund in 2021. It was less than a million dollars. So it wasn't a big fund at all. And it was mostly coming from other founders, like who understood what we were building. And in 2021, we did 11 investments. And out of those 11 investments, um, there was one that kind of scaled really quickly. Um, it was an 18-year-old founder, which was very overlooked <laughs> by the local investment industry. Um, and he built a, a health tech company that scaled very fast. They raised their Series A eight months from idea to, you know, whenever they raise their Series A uh, with General Catalyst, was a, which is an American VC. Um, so so that fund kind of attracted most of the attention uh, towards yeah, us. Yeah. And then we were, I guess we were kind of doing things as we planned and well enough um, to be able to raise a $15 million fund right now, which is the one that we're investing which is now like a, a proper fund, I would say. It's like all of the other things that we were doing were more of like and the MVP side of things. And now yeah. it's like, okay, we understand what we're doing. We're under, we understand the needs of the people that we're attending, which the founders, which would be kind of our clients. So now we can do this at scale. Um, so we're going to do at least 100 investments with this fund, all with the same thesis. So idea stage, digital companies, LATAM, or Spanish speaking. It could be someone from Texas or Spain. Um, so what are the terms? Yeah, so right now it's a fixed deal of 100K against 7% of the company with a post money safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, take in mind that this is at idea stage. Um, but the most interesting thing about Platinus Ventures isn't really the money. It's more about the community that you're being invited to join and you're also going to kind of aggregate value to that. Um, so and you can really sense that when you walk in the doors, you can sense the community that is that is 
here very much present, very yeah. much alive. So mm-hmm. this is a year of the community builders uh, within the region. Yeah. Well, there's more, I guess. Com- community is kind of, I don't know, fashionable right now. I don't know if that's the word. I'm not native mm-hmm. in English. so What I would, might, be, what would I be a better word? Um, it's it's like a, a trendier, I guess. Like yeah. uh, VCs are doing like, we're only doing community-based investments. And sure. all, every startup says like, no, we have a community. And I think you have to be kind of mindful of the word community. Your clients aren't your community and they're not your family either. And your team isn't your family either. They're your team. And that's great. Um, so to build a community, you do you have to um, be very intentional about it or else you're just going to have like a WhatsApp group or a Slack group where like nobody really talks about. Um, and because we're building a community, we started in 2020. The pandemic was in 2020. Renting offices wasn't a good idea, I guess. <laughs> like, uh, but because we we were, and Chile was very strict on like the pandemic conditions. Like, you couldn't go to the supermarket without a permit. Everybody was in house. Um, so, anyways, we decided to kind of materialize what we're building in offices. So we do have offices here in Chile and Santiago, and also in Mexico City, and that really brings people together. And that's where like serendipity happens, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Super cool. And then if if we look a little bit over what's happening in Chile, Santiago is a very, very big hub. Chile overall has been one of the biggest outliers of Latin America for a long time, very well known about its stability, its mm-hmm. its its prospect for for the for the future, attractiveness to to international capital. Is there anything else happening outside of Santiago in mm-hmm. in terms of tech? Any other cities that are, where things are booming yeah. or is it only in Santiago where things are happening. Yeah, if if Chile was a person, he would say or she would say like that is my uh, Achilles is um ankle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we are a very centralized country. So everything has been set happening in Santiago since like forever and I think we can thank the pandemic for kind of decentralizing things a bit more. So a lot of friends of mine who are very talented and intelligent people decided to go live in other cities and have not come back, which is great. And um, so there were some things happening before the pandemic, like you had Endeavor opening Concepcion, and you had kind of like either government or like um, Endeavor, you know, like organizations dedicated to entrepreneurship trying to build capabilities and push the ecosystems. But right now it's happening more organically. Um, yeah. So I would say other things, Cities that look promising and have a lot of talent are, of course, Concepcion, to the south of Chile, mostly. Um, There's a hub in La Región de los Lagos, Puerto Varas. Up north, you have a lot of technology being developed around mining companies, of course. Uh, We're big on mining. The north has a lot of copper. Uh, But if you do come to Chile and you want to kind of check out the startup scene, you cannot miss Santiago. Absolutely, absolutely. And then if we look a little bit on your portfolio from Platanus, um, are you industry agnostic or where is your main focus currently? Industry agnostic. So we've, well, digital, but like everything else is just whatever, whenever we see talented teams, we're going to support them. So we've done dev tools, prop tech, fintech, health tech, ed tech, just kind of anything there. Yeah. And, and from there, um, are these the, the main, main verticals, industry verticals that are hot in Chile? Or what would be the three main verticals in Chile? Yeah, Chile and Latam is fintech. Um, that's where like most of the sh- solutions are being created. There's a lot of unattended population in the region for fintech. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And most of the money is going to fintech as well. Um, so fintech, Chile is different, I guess, to the rest of the region in the sense that uh, there's not a big portion of the population who is unbanked or underbanked, like most of people do have access to financial products. But yeah, so fintech and then in Chile, I would say health tech is 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 definitely booming. Um, there's a lot of prop tech things going on. Um, and then dev tools, like it's not popular. I wouldn't say it's like a strong vertical right now, but I think you'll be surprised two years from now on like all of the solutions that are going to be coming out for developers from yeah. Chile. If we take a look now, how much capital has, has been allocated to Chile, if the region has been receiving in 21, roughly between 15 billion to 20 billion dollars in, in total funding, how much has Chile mm-hmm. received from that pot? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question because you know what? I th- I could give you a number, but the truth is like nobody really freaking knows. 
there's just not enough information. Information is just not um, available or it's not, you know, being investigated well enough. So, yeah, there's just not any accurate number to that answer, to that question. To date. But that's why we're here. Yeah. That's and and from there, uh, how many unicorns mm-hmm. there are currently in, yeah. in, in Chile? So there's um, Not Company, the Not Company. Yeah. That's one corner shop, um, which was acquired by Uber. So some people say that doesn't make them a unicorn, but either way, they, still, they are still worth more than $1 billion. Um, and then uh, Betterfly, which is an HR solution, and soon to be a couple, which I can't say. Okay. <laughs> But we do have a lot of unicorns compared to the rest of the region. And we are s- less people. But why still so little? If we look at the, from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, the stability that Chile has enjoyed, the sophistication of the financial market is, is mm-hmm. you're a lot ahead compared yes. to other countries in the region. Why still, let's say, behind Argentina in terms of unicorns, even yeah. yeah, they're a bigger population. But what would you say that are the main causes that Chile yeah. is... At this stage, in terms yeah. of unicorns. Um, okay, so first and foremost, I don't think you should build a company just be- to become a unicorn. Like, I don't think that should be anybody's goal. Um, but that being said, I think there are a couple of companies who have decided to raise rounds and raise it at their best conditions and decided like not to be unicorns, um, which I think is actually very honorable um, and a great strategy. I don't think we're lacking behind. Um, So you say, yes, of course, Argentina has more unicorns. Brazil has more unicorns. Mexico has more unicorns. If you think about Mexico, Chile has 20 million people in in the country. Mexico City has that amount of people only alone. Uh, Brazil, it's like 300 million people. So I guess for like, if you do like per capita ratio unicorns, we're actually ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, If you think about Colombia, they have, well, now they have two unicorns. Yeah. Yeah. but they are a lot more people than we are. So, True. yeah, I guess it depends on how you look at it. But if it's only by numbers, I would do a ratio. And I think we're not that far behind. Cool. And now it's going to be inevitable that you're going to have more and more things, things coming out, um, higher and higher valuation. Your Platan mm-hmm. is only, you said that you're going to invest 200 companies yeah. um, with the current fund, right? Yes, yes. But it's for, for all of LATAM. So... A Spanish-speaking Latam. Spanish-speaking Latam. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so I think there's a lot, of, just to talk about like the region and why Latam, I guess. Um, so like Latin America is and has a lot of unattended populations in many ways. Um, there's a lot of like social issues, a lot of people who like, it's weird because they have access to technology. Like 90% of the region is digital, which is an amazing number. Absolutely, absolutely. It's more than China. Like, there's more people with access to internet in Latin America than in China. But the percentage of the GDP um, in LATAM, which is represented by tech companies, is very small. It's not even 1%. Um, And in China, it's 50%. Um, And then if you go for, like, to to the list of the top 10 companies contributing to the GDP of the region, there's only one which is technological, which is Mercado Libre. Mm -hmm. It's like the local competition for Amazon. Um. And the rest, it's like, you know, copper companies or, you know, like gas companies. Very, uh, very traditional businesses. Very traditional. Um, so there's there's an opportunity, right? There's like, there's a lot of ingredients in the pot that would make it now the best moment to build digital companies. So unattended people who, who have access to internet um, and use it because it's not only access, uh, like a more mature VC industry. And then, yeah, like lack of representation of technology in the peop- in the companies who are bringing money and creating impact in the region. So I'm I'm very certain that it's a great moment to come here and establish your company and create solutions. Absolutely, absolutely. And if we take a look on the overall market of Latin America, what is a very big trend for for obvious reasons because of the stage of development for multiple different countries within Latin America, there are a lot of certain way copycats that you're taking ideas, companies, products that are being developed and have been developed for, for multiple years in, in the US or Europe or um, Asia. And and founders are 
making their own twist with that product and bringing that into here. So there's a lot of these happening and there's still a lot of opportunities within these type of models. Yes. Proven models are you taking here and, and making local and, and hopefully growing them into very, very large scale. Yes. What do you think that how long this trend will continue, mm -hmm. meaning that there's going to be a lot, let's say, these type of copycats and models being implemented in Latin America mm -hmm. before it reaches to a point that others are going to start mimicking and copying the products that the founders' companies are building in Latin America and they want to see, hey, goodness, we don't have those. Yeah. Let's bring them to Europe. Yeah. When do you think that this is going to change? Gonna ha change? Um, if it has to, right? Like, would you say it has to happen? or Not, ne not necessarily, okay. not necessarily. Okay, so yeah, we're definitely like at a copycat moment. Um, so like same corner shop, which is one of the Chilean unicorns, is a kind of a inspired in Instacart. Um, so um, I'm not sure why that's the wrong thing to be a copycat. Like if if there's a um, there, if there's people who want to use your product and don't have any other possibility to use it, like why not? Like and it also makes sense. We're agreed, very agreed. Yeah. And we are very globalized, right? Like starting a company now is not the same as 20 years ago and way, way, way like um, different to 40 years ago. So it makes sense for, for, for like us to inspire ourselves in whatever else is happening in the world. That being said, I'm not sure if Europe is going to copy LATAM, but maybe Africa will or maybe Asia will, uh, Southeast Asia will, um, or maybe the other way around. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's like a breaking point for that. I think... Uh, one other thing that's happening in the region is that most of the money is coming from foreign investors. Um, so there's more and more local investors, like kind of, um, yeah, so SoftBank, CRV, and multiple investors from the US are kind of looking, or, or Asia are kind of looking at LATAM and investing. So it has to make sense to them as well. They have to understand it if they want an opportunity, if startups want an opportunity to raise with them. So yeah, for that reason, I think there's a lot of copycat moment. Yeah, I guess if we have like a more mature local invest investment industry, then there's more chances that people will be building locally and raising locally. Yeah. And if we take a look now from here to the funding environment, when we are investigating the deals executed on, on, on the region, one big differentiating factor that we have witnessed is that if we do comparisons to the US or Europe is that if you go for seed round or series A, you have a lot less investors included in that round in Europe or in the U.S. Here, when you look in Latin America, you have a hot deal for 500K or 1 million. You know? yeah. Then you have multiple, multiple VCs. Mm -hmm. It can be over five VCs involved in that round. Yes. Why is that the case? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think like it's just the average ticket is, is smaller because funds are smaller, right? Um, and it's also like a follower industry. Like people do want to have social proof that something's kind of hot and worth it and kind of tag along with that. So, yeah, I also think, well, it's also very collaborative. It might be a follower industry, but I think in LATAM, there is a collaboration spirit throughout the region. So if you have uh, the opportunity to do like a great investment, it's not a bad idea to call your friend and kind of invite them in to do that. And I think VCs do that as well and kind of, you know, um, share the opportunities available. I agree. But could it be also that because LATAM is, is getting a lot of new funds that have been launched in the past couple of years, mm -hmm. um, a lot of first time funds, fund managers, there is this tremendous pressure for obvious reasons to deliver on their first funds in order to, to, to satisfy their LPs that people are just making safer bets. Let's say if you mm -hmm. if you know that all of the major players are in, in the region investing in these ones and that, you know you need to follow suit in order to be able to look at least somewhat yeah. okay yeah. for your next fund. Uh do you see that this is one of the the, the causes? Yeah, it's a great hypothesis. I wouldn't know <laughs> how like their <laughs> brain is working when they're making these decisions, but I think it's it's actually a great hypothesis. I think we should all do well. Like the best thing for LATAM is for all for most of the funds to do well because um, it's kind of to be proven if VC is worth at the eyes of, you know, your investors, your LPs, which are normally family offices and right. they're quite traditional. Yeah. So everybody has to be convinced that this is a, an industry worthwhile and worth your money. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we 
then take a look on on your portfolio companies and the companies that you're sourcing. Very early stage, your portfolios and the companies you're looking at, obviously, but then because the industry has not matured in Latin America, what type of uh, talent gaps that you're seeing? What I mean by this is that the industry is not mature is that when you go to US or Europe, you have a lot of people in the team and available in, in, in the market that have been doing two, three, four startups, mm -hmm. different stages. They've been going through the, the, the roller coaster multiple times. So they have a lot of perspective, a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And how do you see here, um, let's say if we first start in Chile and then we go to the, the, the region overall, that town pool, is there some lacks? Is there some needs that needs to be developed still because the ecosystem is young? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, LATAM, I mean, the diversity of talent is actually, it's, it's, it, it varies very much from country to country. Um, and that has to do with, you know, like education. And in the case of Chile, it has to do on how liberal or how open we are to international markets. Um, Chile is one of the countries that has like the most international agreements in the world, free trade agreements. I think it's one of the most or the most. So because of that, there's just like an openness to to the rest of the economies. And that brings a lot of ideas as well, a lot of opportunities. I think Chile has very good talent um, for the population that we are. Uh, that being said, um, the scarcest talent in the region and in the world is the technical talent, right? Um, so you have like a booming industry, which is technology. Um And it's growing like almost exponentially in the world, but the talent available to build that technology isn't growing at the same pace. Um, so there's definitely more demand than offer of, of developers overall. And what is scarcest is like amazing developers, right? So that's one of the reasons that we actually have our thesis where one of the founders has to be technical. It's just like not anyone, like, I don't know, coming out of a boot camp, like a three month boot camp, uh, to, kind of qualify as a technical yeah. founder. Um, so if you do want to attract the best talent in, in, in the region and kind of, you're kind of competing with uh, Meta and, you know, yeah. Fang in general, and that's, that's very hard because you don't pay the amount of salaries that those guys are paying. And it's still very prestigious for a Latin American person to work in Amazon or Google. So uh, if you want to compete with that, the best way to do so is to like be someone uh, who a great dev would admire um, and he would come work for you because he wants to work with you. Like he finally finds you someone who can, he can learn from. He thinks you're probably going to build something amazing. He wants to, or she wants to be part of that journey. Um, and he's just convinced by you and he does, he's not convinced by the salary that you're going to be paying. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of founder we're, we're bringing on into our community. Yeah. yeah. And, and just a question on that, you mentioned that, hey, you're competing like everywhere in the world, competing with, with the big players like Meta. How much in Chile, let's say in Santiago, would a full stack developer with a five-year experience, what are the salaries for Meta yeah. here? It depends. Like it also depends on his experience, who, who he's been developing for um, and kind of his trajectory. But I guess like, um, okay, so for just like a freshly, like fresh graduate out of Universidad Católica, which mm -hmm. is a, a respected university here, they would be making like at least, at very least, um, $1,500, uh, just like right out of university or maybe $1,000, but that's like a very least. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Normally those guys would be making $2,500. Um, and then for a five-year graduate, a full stack developer with experience, yeah, I would expect at least at least like four thousand through five thousand dollars per month. Uh, we yeah, we don't think yearly as yeah, Americans yeah. do. We yeah. do it per month. Yeah, yeah. And from there, if we do the comparison for your portfolio firms, what are you, let's say, overall mm -hmm. seeing that for same quality positions, five year experience, full stack developer comes and joins the team? Yeah. What are they? The startups paying then? Yeah, and like it's still in that range. Like startups at at this stage that we invest in are still in idea stage. Everything's to be proven, Com like clients are to become. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they don't necessarily have a lot of money. Um, so they'd be paying whatever the market's paying or maybe even less, but giving out stock options and you know the possibility to join this awesome thing that I'm creating. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And how big are the stock option pools here, typically? Um, it depends on, yeah, at least 10%. 10 to 20% are ESOP. Okay. Yeah. Pretty standard still. The thing with, yeah, standard. The thing with um, option pools and stock options in LATAM is that we don't have enough exits yet. Like, I guess that's the bottleneck in the ecosystem right now, like IPOs or uh -huh. merges. Yeah. Just a way for everyone to, like, liquidate whatever they've been investing in that company for that many years. So now it's more of like a romantic thing to offer. Like, yeah, I'll give you, yeah. I'll give you five percent of whatever I'm building. So yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. and normally, because the, that's on one hand, like no exits, and on the other hand, like uh, employees aren't educated on stock options enough to understand the value. So it also kind of uh, angries or frustrates the founders when they've made a lot of like sacrifices with ESOP uh, and option pools. Um, and you know the people who are receiving them are just not understand. They don't value them, so that's that's quite frustrating, I guess. Wow, yeah. So stock options are, you have to know how to present them to a potential um, hire. But I guess the first ten people you hire are they probably understand and they're very intelligent, so it's not a hard sell. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And from there, if we go to the final themes of 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 today. What would you say that are the main risks of technology startups first in Chile and then on a wider perspective in whole Latin America? The main risk? Risks, yeah. Threats overall for, for them okay, threats. to be successful uh, and the risks associated with the region mm -hmm. yeah. overall because into when looking into the region... Unless you're spending a lot of time over here, from an outsider perspective, it looks extremely chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and that makes people scared mm -hmm. because they don't know. So yeah. th this is like we see this as a huge risk because you cannot trust yeah. the 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 institutions in a way that you can trust in the U.S. And that's why a lot of companies are building up their their holding companies and then they're taking mm -hmm. their cash into to to Delaware Corporation, for instance. Yeah. So what are like the these type of risks mm -hmm. that you see in, in, in Chile, per uh -huh. se. Um, yeah. So um, there's like different answers to that. But since we're touching like institutions, I guess institutions in LATAM, there's not enough institutionality in the region. Chile is different in that way. We do have stronger institutions and people respect institutions more, I guess, than whatever's happening in other countries. It, we are at a at a moment where every, everything's very questioned. So like the police institution is being questioned, government is being questioned. It, at every moment that we've been kind of challenged as a collective, as, a, you know, as citizens of Chile, uh, challenged to kind of break down institutions, it hasn't happened. So I think yeah. people transversally still respect and kind of want to keep everything together um, in Chile. So, uh Yeah. Um, so I guess that kind of spooks uh, foreign investment, like, you know, this chaotic or lack of um, respect and lack of, um, I don't know, uh, strength of the institutions in LATAM. So that's always a risk. Like if anything, mm -hmm. like if, um, you know, institutions start falling down, then the money goes away. Um, the interest, at least on in investing, goes away. I think like um, one risk that or one threat that might happen maybe in the next upcoming months or, or couple of years is that promising companies don't do well. Um, mm -hmm. So you have a lot of unicorns and everybody's like, yeah, just, this guy's unicorn, so they did it. And that's not true. Like yeah, a yeah. company is very hard to the very end. Um, and the very end can be an exit or can be like, you know, not working, the company not working it out and having to close. So if um, one of these promises, which are still very few throughout the region, doesn't do well, then I mean, it's going to spook investment. It's going to spook people who wanted to come into the startup industry to work, it's going to be probably a domino effect and other companies are not going to be able ac to access um, capital anymore or the correct talent anymore. And that might be just threatening overall. Um, yeah. Uh, with VCs, I would say the same, but the cycles for VCs are just slower. So you do like yeah. 10 year funds. It's not going to happen that quickly. Um, and yeah, so one thing that is still a reality for, for, for Latin America is that we are U.S. dependent. Uh, mm. So startups incorporate their companies in Delaware. Sometimes they do in Cayman. Um, but 
Because the money's there. And as you said before, like a U.S. investor would never invest in a Chilean, you know, uh, holding. Yeah. And it makes sense. Uh, so we're kind of attached to whatever's happening in other economies. In other economies. Yeah. Yeah. But from there, if we go to the then ultimate theme now, the biggest opportunities you see that what 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 is going to Latin America look like in 20 years? If mm -hmm. we, we fast forward a little bit over to we go to 2050. Mm hmm. What is the market and the environment like in Latin America in your wildest dreams? Uh, if I'm an optimist, I mean, yeah, like the, uh, that list that we were talking about before, like the 10, um, you know, the, 10, the top 10 companies that are bringing most of the GDP into the country, into the region. I would say at least nine of them have to be technology companies, right? Uh, that would be a great scenario. That would mean that, um, you know, like the, the region is progressing. Mm -hmm. um, so I I would also think that we could have like better tax agreements amongst each other as countries. So building a company in Chile would easily mean at the same time Colombia and Mexico. Yeah. Or, you know, kind of strengthening those uh, alliances that we already have and kind of bringing the people that are in charge of government and public policy decisions that those people understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The industry, like for real, um, I think that would be a great thing to happen. Um, I would say we would have more formal work and, you know, just having these technology companies providing job opportunities to more parts of the population and also having like great work conditions and not just, yeah. you know, being a you know, Uber driver and not having any safety yeah. around that contract. What else for for it's twenty years from now? Like anything can happen, right? Hopefully we're f hopefully we have like people like fighting over um, fighting over the the startup deals, and there's just so much money that startups don't have to worry about you know getting yeah. capital to build these solutions. And yeah, I don't know. Like I would say unicorns, but I don't want to say it because I said yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yes. I don't think it's a <laughs> you know a goal on its own. Yeah. Sounds great. And then for on a personal note, you're you're now creating a huge impact in the region. You're one of the most active funds within mm -hmm. within the region uh, of Latin America. Where do you see yourself going within the next 20 years or so? Are you going to Me personally? Yeah, want to mm -hmm. create this impact through through allocating mm -hmm. capital or this is this is the trajectory you see yourself for, for yeah. the very very long term. I've never seen myself as an investor per se. Like I wasn't, I didn't, I studied psychology. Exactly. Like, yeah. I like to create things. I like for, I think like it's a privilege, it's a, it's a privilege that people don't really speak about. Like, like the opportunity to put whatever's in your mind and kind of put that in the real world is, it's a privilege. Like it's a huge luxury. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, and I wouldn't want to, want to lose it and I don't want to kind of stay still ever so it's just building stuff right now it's building this this inspires me i think i think tech companies have the potential to change like the well-being of the population in latin america so i'm doing that right now i'm never focused on that and i'll keep doing that for now but if it's not that it's definitely something uh i'm gonna be leading i guess sounds great well thanks a lot paula for sharing your thoughts on, on Chile and the region of Latin America overall and sharing your story to the audience. I, I really enjoyed the chat. So thank you very much for participating. Yeah, thank you for inviting me.